Can you hear me now? You sound great. You look great. <laughs> so do you, brother. So let's talk about uh, Colombia. Okay. Yes. So 50 years ago, uh, 50 years in, in June, June 8th, I turned uh, 5 -0. Uh, I celebrated my 50th birthday, and I was born uh, in Medellin, Colombia, um, which um, I was born to very uh, working class parents uh, in Medellin, which uh, down there is really uh, quite poor. Uh, there really are, are only kind of two socioeconomic classes in Colombia. You're either wealthy or you're not. And uh, they definitely fell in the not category. Uh, both parents had a, um, a grade school education, uh, but were very hard workers. And um, they received a, uh, uh, quite a big surprise when I was born. Um, I already had a older brother and older sister, so I was child number three. And when I was born, my parents were informed um, that uh, I would be born uh, with a special birth defect uh, rendering me uh, missing both of my arms and my right leg. So let's fast forward to, to later on in life. Did you ever talk to your parents about how they felt when they found out that their third child was born with no arms and only one leg? Did you speak to your mom, your dad, or both? To both. And it's very interesting you ask that because... I really feel that I definitely gained my personality from both sides. Uh, my father was very outgoing and very jovial. My mother, very introspective um, and very um, uh, introverted. Uh, but they both really kind of had the same conclusion in which they told me that they just had a uh, overwhelming sense of peace uh, when they were told that because um, they knew there was nothing wrong that they had done. Uh, my my mother had never drank or smoked or 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 done anything risky. Um, and and you know I, I attribute it most definitely to the peace of God uh, because it was just a very uh, to hear that sort of news and to feel a uh, peace um, could only be divine. And um, they said that they what they told me was when they heard the news they basically said okay. You know, uh, this is quite a shock, certainly. But uh, if this is what we what we got to deal with, then we'll accept it. And um, they they I believe that because they accepted it with a sense of peace right away, that really translated to me. Um, you know, when I was born, just having a peace about it, and and having that translate to me as well as I grew up. So when you when you when you were a kid growing up what did your parents I'm going to I'm going to lean on your mom since I know that you've had the a closer relationship with your mom that I know what did she say was some of the challenges raising such a, a special needs child like you like you were Well the big thing big thing Sean was in that at that point in the early 70s um, Columbia didn't have any sort of special services or special education. The big thing was going to be how the heck was I going to get around? Mm -hmm. I mean, I literally had one good leg. So even as, as you know, most babies begin to crawl and walk, um, I literally had that one limb. And so it was going to be, how is this kid going to move around? How is he going to feed himself? Um, now, uh, my parents, again, both pretty much just accepted that, they were going to have to get me around everywhere. They were going to have to feed me. They were going to have to do everything for me. Um, and, and pretty much um, knew that there was, it was going to be something they were going to have to do forever because in Colombia at that time, uh, there wasn't special education. There wasn't any sort of services to where I could go to school and where I could even dream of a future. Um, however, uh, when I was four years old, uh, a miracle happened. And that was that I had an aunt and uncle, uh, Theo and Athea, uh, already living in California. And that aunt was my mom's sister. Uh, and so her husband ran into someone, uh, li literally, literally bumped into someone that was a Shriner. And the guy had a hat that said uh, San Francisco Shriners in Northern California. And he asked him, 
what, what's that? What do the Shriners do? And the guy says, oh, we're an organization that takes kids from all over the world. And if they have orthopedic needs or they are burn victims, we bring them to the U.S. and we take care of them. And of course, my uncle's reaction was, you know, for how much? What's the catch? And he says, there's no cost. That's just what we do. And um, my uncle just about choked on a cigarette because they were on a on a smoke break together. And uh, he says, well, I have a nephew in Medellin, Colombia. He was born about three years ago, triple amputee. And we don't know what the heck we're going to do about his future because he's born in quite a dire situation. And the Shriner told him, uh, if you can get him to the U.S. and he can come to one of our clinics and we see that he can be a good candidate for prosthetics, we'll take care of him. And call it what you want, call it fate, call it destiny, call it luck of the Irish. I call it a miracle. Uh, my life changed from that day forward. Uh, it was arranged for me to come to the U.S., go to the clinic. They saw that I could wear prosthetics, and so they decided that uh, I would move to the U.S. and grow up here uh, where there were the services and where I could go to school and have a normal life. And so that aunt uh, became like a second mom to me. Uh, so I've been blessed really with two moms in my life and, and two sets of parents. Uh, and that, that day uh, completely transformed my life uh, and gave me the, uh, the complete restart that I needed. So, uh, so Alex, how old were you when this happened? I was about uh, three and a half, so I moved up here when I was four. And at that young age, I mean, you were just kind of down to go with the flow, but you were separated from your mom though, right? Right, right. That was really the only thing I understood was that, um, you know, from day one, I was definitely a mama's boy. And they were basically telling me that, I now had to leave her, and of course that was terrifying. Uh, but from the very little that I that I recall, and and a lot a lot of it is kind of recalled more through the eyes of others and what they've told me, uh, was that my mother pretty much you know knew that it was going to be extremely painful for her as well. Uh, but she galvanized the strength to sit me down and tell me, um, "You're about to move to the United States. You will move in with other family." Um, we won't be with you, but you'll always be able to call us. And the whole reason you're moving is to have a new life. And I think probably once I got my prosthetics, I understood. I just kind of understood, you know, what all was going on. Um, but it was it was very hard. Um, you know, I was four years old. I was in a brand new country, learning a brand new language. I only spoke Spanish at that point. Um, all of a sudden, I, I was just given arms. My, my prosthetic hooks uh, here that you can see on the screen. Uh, I was given a, a prosthetic leg. And, and I think just, um, I, I just kind of intrinsically knew, okay, this is, this is why I'm up here. And, um, you know, uh, I believe that especially children that are in adverse situations, they just got to grow up real quick and they got to mature real quick, whatever the circumstance may be. And as much as I missed my family, um, I, I, I got it and I just started growing up real quick. So I want to welcome Hog, Hog 66, Cooper Clouser 5, Mike Solis, Juan Sanchez. You guys are tapping into my live conversation with Alex Montoya, who was born a triple amputee. He was born with no arms and only one leg. Uh, he was born in, in Medellin, correct? Correct. Medellin, Colombia, and at the age, between the ages of three and four, a miracle happened for him. A group called Shriners that were going to take him here to the United States and fit him with prosthetics free of charge. This happened through an, an aunt, his mom's sister. So, so Alex, hi, Riley Baker. Let me just give you a little... Um, what part of California, Alex? We um, began in Northern California. Um, the San Francisco Shriners uh, took care of me. Uh, part of the, of the initial process was they had to uh, take my right hip, uh, which really was where a knee would have formed, um, and they needed it to function as a hip. So I had a, a surgery 
uh, in, in order to do that in, in my first few months here in the U.S., uh, and that was then the San Francisco Shriners. Um, so my family lived in Vallejo, California, uh, which is uh, kind of in the East Bay area, and um, we spent about a year there, and then once I got my prosthetics, got the surgery done, and um, engaged in physical therapy to learn how to use them, uh, my uncle, who was in the U.S. Marines at that point, um, got uh, stationed in San Diego. And so we all moved down to San Diego. And uh, my mom fell in love with San Diego. And I call her my mom. Um, she, you know, she's my tia. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll make that distinction real quick. When I talk about my aunt, I usually, I usually use the, the terminology mama. That's just what I grew up calling her. And then when I talk about my biological mother, I, I say my mother. Uh, just to make it easier for people. Um, so my mama fell in love with San Diego right away, and she said, um, this is where we're going to stay. And so as a result, I grew up in San Diego. So, so Alex, is Shriner the same group that we see running these commercials all the time now? Yes, the exact same group. Um, I'm not sure how many years they've been in existence uh, probably going on a hundred years that they've been around a long, long time. I was about to ask. Yeah, that was fifty yeah. years ago for you. They, they've been. They've been. Yeah, it was fifty for me. So, and they had been around uh, long before that. Um, they're just a uh, uh, a service oriented uh, fraternal organization. Uh, that, to be perfectly frank, uh, it, to me, it, it's also a miracle that they are still in existence uh, because so much has changed when it comes to. The border and immigration issues and you know all sorts of things um that it, you know it's just not as uh, clear-cut as, as it once was uh but they're still they're still there and they still take kids from all over the world and if the kids have uh, orthopedic needs or are burn victims there are a series of shriners hospitals across the country uh, that take those kids in and help them uh, and i should add normally the services go until age 18 uh, for me, they extended it to age 21 uh, since I had gotten accepted to college. So, Alex, how were you able to come over from Colombia to the United States without citizenship? What they did was they allowed me to enter on a, um, a visitor's uh, visa. And then um, that, uh, that was both a visitor's and a medical visa. And so um, throughout my childhood, I was here underneath that. And then it's very interesting you ask because that all expired when I turned 18. And yeah. so there was a period of time where I was undocumented uh, in this country. And how did you, how were you able to navigate that? Did people, did people know and just kind of turn their head the other way or what, what happened with that? Yeah, uh, you know, again, my, my life has been a series of miracles. And um, I had a friend who was a newspaper reporter here in San Diego um, who, who basically asked if he could um, write an article on my situation because at that time I, was, I became undocumented, uh, but I was also applying to schools. And, you know, one thing had to give. I either had to, to uh, become a citizen or um, technically the U.S. government had – uh, the legal right at that point to deport me. And so my family was quite scared. Uh, they, they didn't know what to do about it. And uh, this reporter said, um, we need to take a little gamble and, and we need to uh, do an article. And I will bet you that the public sentiment uh, will, will be on our side. And so that, um, you know, people won't allow uh, anything like that to happen. And sure enough, at that point, uh, it was the Immigration and Naturalization Service, INS, before it became Homeland Security. Um, they actually, uh, they were contacted and they said, uh, they advised us to um, go through the legal process and go to an immigration judge. Uh, they said they, they were going to um, uh, not deport me, but the judge had to be the one to officially um, I guess you could say a rule uh, that I needed to stay in the country. Uh, and so that is that is what happened. 
Uh, but it was still scary because I, I just I knew that even though that was what was promised, uh, just knowing that they had the legal right uh, to deport me, send me back to to Colombia, um, you know, was still a scary uh, situation. Um, but it was it was a very different time. It was the, the early 90s and uh, really anti-immigrant sentiment wasn't as strong as it, as it is now. And uh, I, you know, I don't I don't know what I would have, would have done if, if the situation occurred today. Um, but we just uh, we just kept the faith and kept the faith that it was going to work out. And so in July of 92, I was granted uh, legal residency, which then opened the door for me to uh, a few years later uh, earning full citizenship. And that was strictly a, a decision made by one judge, correct? One judge, one judge here in San Diego, a federal judge. So it could have went very, very differently. Yeah, you know, um, I, I encourage people to uh, jump on Google and 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 Google, you know, my name and immigration case uh, because it actually made headline news. Uh, I, I really don't talk about it a whole lot because it seems like it was many moons ago, uh, a whole lifetime away. Uh, but we made we made front page news across the country uh, because I was really the first DACA student before DACA was ever a thing. And uh, that really kind of paved the way for things like DACA and, and Dreamers uh, to really be um, created uh, because now there was precedent of a judge saying, okay, we have somebody here who did enter legally, uh, became illegal, but has proven that uh, he is someone that, con that can contribute uh, to our country and even though we have the legal right to send him away, um, I'm going to intervene and ensure that he stays here. And just that sort of mindset, that sort of principle is really what, um, what opened the door for, for DACA uh, to exist. So I want to say hello to everybody who's joining us, Pablo Skywalker, Mike, um, Joe Smith, uh, Here No Evil Monkey just joined us, Audrey, Juan Sanchez is back. Uh, my guest is Alex Montoya, who was born with a birth defect in Medellin, Colombia. He was born with no arms and one leg. And he just went through the whole process of which went down that enabled him to stay in the United States. So, so Alex, really what I want to get into is once you got here to the United States and you got, you got fitted for your prosthetics, you said you had a surgery, um, and your hip where your knee was supposed to be growing out of, what was it like going to school? And what school did you go to? And how, did, how were you able to interact with the other kids um, that were quote unquote able-bodied? What was that experience like for you being so different from, from everybody else? Sean, it was more challenging than we expected because the first thing that we learned when I became uh, of age to be able to, to go to school was that um, in San Diego, as in most of the country, and of course, California is always the most progressive state. Uh, if you had a disability, you couldn't go to school with non-disabled kids. And so um, we just kind of presumed that once I turned five, I'd be able to go to kindergarten and just go the, the, the same route everyone else goes through. Um, but we were quickly told, no, no, we have uh, two separate types of campuses. We have disabled campuses and non-disabled campuses. And my family was shocked. And so uh, for the first year uh, that I could, that I was eligible to go to school, uh, they put me at, at a school by the name of Lindbergh, I'm sorry, Schweitzer Elementary, uh, named after the famed Dr. Albert Schweitzer. Um, and it was all kids with disabilities, all kinds of disabilities. Um, and my, my, my aunt and uncle, my, my second set of parents, um, uh, agreed to do that for a year. And then they said, okay, look, he needs to be in a regular education setting. Um, uh, he needs to be in the same type of world he's going to be in as he grows up. And so they really advocated, uh, for me to be able to do that. Um, fortunately, Schweitzer was connected, uh, physically connected to a non-disabled school uh, by the name of Lindbergh Elementary, uh, named after the aviator Charles Lindbergh. 
And that was, of course, a non-disabled regular education school. And um, what we didn't know was behind the scenes, there had already been a group of teachers and administrators that were trying to really um, advocate for this and, and, and take up this cause. And what they found in my family um, was a willing set of was a willing family to be able to to take on this cause, and so uh, we did, and we petitioned the school district and we petitioned all the powers that be uh, to allow uh, those of us that that did not have a a mental or uh, developmental intellectual disability to be able to be in a regular education setting, and so in 1980. What the school district did was they they kind of came up with a compromise. They said, um, "Hey, chief, uh, keep going." Alex. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, one day, one day a week in 1980, they said we will allow the special ed students to come to the regular education campus, um, see if they if they can make it, see how the kids react, and uh, and we'll go from there. Uh, and initially, a lot of the a lot of the teachers uh, at Lindbergh. Um, uh, resisted because they said our classrooms are already crowded. We have no training. We don't want to be liable if any of these students get hurt. It's not something we want. Uh, the San Diego Unified School District overruled that and uh, basically uh, forced them to take us one day a week. Uh, but then they also said we want the kids at Lindbergh to go to Schweitzer one day a week and just help out in the classroom and get to know those kids. And um, by the end of the semester, it was such it was such a successful Alexa off. It was such a successful uh, experiment that there actually ended up being a waiting list of teachers that wanted more uh, kids with disabilities in their classrooms because they saw uh, all the positive things that were happening. Uh, and then a year later, they decided to um, to really uh, make transformational change. And they uh, they integrated us fully uh, into a regular education campus. So uh, let me cut you off, Alex. Are you are you telling me that Alex Montoya was the guinea pig in San Diego that opened up disabled kids to go to school with non-disabled kids? Is that what you're telling me? Yes, sir. And and I'm proud to tell you that because of that. Uh, I actually have a place in the school district hall of fame um, for being that catalyst of change. Um, and, you know, at that point, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea that we were doing something so monumental. I was just excited to be with new friends and be in, in an environment that I knew was better for me. Um, but, yeah, you know, a lot of times with social justice movements, Sean, I, I have two I have two thoughts when it comes to movements in general. Number one, a lot of times people are involved in movements um, without really kind of knowing what's going on. Uh, the movement is kind of thrust upon them. And number two, a movement doesn't become a movement until people who aren't directly affected start caring. And so when teachers and parents of non-disabled kids saw that this was going on, um, and they said, you know, th this is BS. Like these kids should be with our kids every day. That's when when change really started happening. That's amazing. You, you know, it's it's interesting. We've never had this conversation before. You know, and we met. Um, I want to say 16 years ago now. 2000. No, no, no. Oh six. Long, longer than that. Yeah, I believe it was oh six. Eight, eight. We've known each other for 18 years. And we've had these conversations about being in San Diego and feeling, and I'm not equating, I'm just saying, yeah. when, you, when you talk about being the, the only, I can relate to being the only yeah. because you changed an entire school district. I was the first black kid to go to the, 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 the Catholic grade school that I went to. And I got taken, the similarities are kind of chilling. Yeah. I was in a grade school where I fit in. Right. 
And then my mother took me out of that grade school and put me in a, a Catholic school where it was all white. Mm. And because of that is going to make me ask you this question. When you went from being in a school with all disabled kids like yourself and, and overnight, now you're with able-bodied kids and you're the only disabled kid. What was that like for you mentally? And, and what were some of the things that you had to deal with? Um, I just want to say hello to folks that are joining us. Um, Lita Short, Sue, um, El Camino Wacko, <laughs> William, thank you for the applause. So talk, talk, talk me through that, Alex. What was, what was that transition like for you? How did you feel when you were amongst other disabled kids? How was your confidence? How was your self-esteem? And then you go to a school full of able-bodied kids and you're the only kid with a dis, dis not just a disability, but a major disability. Right. At Schweitzer, the disabled school, um, I was king of the hill, man. I, I knew that um, I just had the personality and, you know, it was just kind of the way that I was raised at home. Um, you are the same as everyone else and you are a normal kid. That's what my, what my aunt and uncle uh, would really emphasize to me. And, um, you know, you're going to be a well-adjusted kid. I quickly saw that not all of my classmates had that. They certainly had parents who instead uh, would coddle them or, you know, kind of uh, really focus more on their frailties, their needs. And so um, just with my personality, um, I, I really kind of became a, a de facto leader and a, a big fish in a small pond. Um, mm -hmm. But even the teachers recognized that because they, they told my parents, he doesn't, he don't belong here. He doesn't belong here. He needs to be somewhere where he's challenged. And, you know, with all due respect, these kids are all at various learning levels and he is at a, a different learning level. He needs to be somewhere that will challenge him more. Um, so then a year later, when I am in that environment um, and I am with 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 all other kids who do not have disabilities, uh, I had I had maybe a handful of kids with disabilities that came over with me, but we were all put in different classrooms. Mm -hmm. So I, I related very well and I can still relate very well to walking into a room and being the only person of your group in that room. I, I walked into my classroom and I was absolutely the only kid with a disability in that classroom. And initially it was very hard. Um, it was very lonely because the kids didn't really know what to make of me. They didn't know what they could say. They didn't know um, what, what, what they could ask. This was something new to them as well. And so uh, the first, first few weeks were, were, were very lonely. But um, as usual with change, it just takes one person to spark change. And I had um, uh, a friend uh, by the name of uh, Margarita who uh, just walked over to me one day and said, hi, my name is Margarita. And she stuck her hand out and she was the first person that I had ever met who did that. And so I stuck my hook out and I, I, I let her shake my hook, you know, as we shook hands. And that signified to the rest of the class Okay, I guess this. I guess this guy's okay. I guess he's a normal kid. And again, kids being kids, um, once they saw that I was approachable and that I was okay, all the kids came over. All the kids uh, began asking questions, and they all wanted to get to know me. And if I may, Sean, I'll, I'll tell a very quick story. Um, it only took a couple of days for the kids to uh, look me up and down, and one of the kids to notice. That my prosthetic arms had uh, hollow elbows at the at the at the joint. That I had like a hollow space at the joint, and one of them said, "You know, those elbows would be kind of nice for us to be able to stick our candy in." And I said, uh, "I said, yeah, you're right." I said, "How about this? Um, you put your candy in my arms, and uh, I'll hold them for you for the whole day because you know we couldn't have candy in class." And uh, as long as you guys give me a couple pieces of candy at the, end of the, at the end of the day, like I will store your candy for you. And so all the kids signed up for that and they all did that. And um, the, the, the main challenge was 
uh, during during class, I couldn't I couldn't lift up my arms because the candies were rattling around in there. <laughs> and so I was sitting at my desk. This is first grade now. I was sitting at my desk, and you could you could literally hear every time I went to write a note or I went to 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 you know just grab a pencil or something. You could hear rattling, and I could see my teacher look over real quick and be like, "What the heck is that?" And I, and I, and you know she she couldn't see anything, so she just walked away. And this happened about three or four times. And me always being a lover of learning, always being somebody that just you know, wanted to talk and wanted to speak. You know, I saw all these kids answering questions wrongly, and it frustrated me. And so by the end of the day, the teacher asked a question, and somebody got it wrong, and I just I, I had it. So I raised my arm real quick to answer the question myself. And all the candy fell out, and <laughs> and the teach the teacher looked at me and she and she was shocked. She was like, "What the heck?" And I said, "Oops." And uh, she said, uh, "Alejandro Montoya, you stay after class. I need to have a word with you." And of course, all the kids were like, "Ooh!" And I was like, "Shut, shut up! It's your candy." So um, she 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 sat me down and she said, "Why are you holding candy in your arms?" And I said, well, to be honest with you, I was just trying to make friends. I was just holding their candy in order for, for them to like me and to be able to make friends. And uh, I remember she just kind of got a smile on her face and she said, Alex, kids will like you because of you. They will like you because of your personality. Just be who you are. And uh, it's very admirable that you wanted to help them, but uh, don't bring any more candy into the school. Let the kids get to know you for you. And that was really a, a key learning lesson for me uh, because I felt like that was something I had to do to gain their acceptance. And I was also afraid the kids were not going to speak to me after that. Um, but they all came back the next day and they said, nah, man, we're cool. Um, and um, I, I, I decided to uh, take that little episode, that little adventure. And uh, years, years later, I wrote a children's book on it um, because even though that happened some 45 years ago, the issues of, of how we treat anyone else that, that looks different or um, you know has any sort of difference and, 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 and the importance of kindness and the importance of being that first person to be the spark, to be that friend um, is still prevalent today, no matter what that, that difference is. Um, so that was, uh, that was how I made my very first friends and how I began to um, to, uh, to 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 gain acceptance uh, uh, in school, and it still it still wasn't easy beyond that. Um, what I noticed, Sean, was um, anyone that was not within our classroom. So, in other words, anyone that that really didn't get a chance to know me, kids in other classes, especially kids who didn't have a disabled student in their classroom, they would see me in the hallways. And they would say, there goes a the little robot. Or they would say, you know, hey, little robot, can you make a move for me? Or uh, I, I, I heard you're I heard you're a human pinata, little robot. And they would tease me and they would, you know, call me all these names. And um, I didn't know how to react. I, I just I just for the most part ignored them, but just felt, you know, very, very bad about myself. Um, but once my classmates got wind of that, they started talking to the other kids and said, hey, man, don't do that. Don't don't call him names. His name is Alex. He's a regular guy. He's a cool kid. If you talk to him, he's going to be cool with you. And that is actually what um, what, what got the bullying uh, stopped was my friends intervening uh, in that situation and um, just, you know, helping me to, to get along. My boy Alex Montoya is joining me on TikTok Live. He was born with uh, no arms and and only one leg, and we're talking about his grade school experience. Alex, so much of what you're saying I can relate to just from a, a different perspective. Um, at what point in grade school did you start liking girls? <laughs> and and, oh, and how did that go for you? Because it was very very challenging for me to say the least to be in a classroom 
in the the seventies yeah. and early eighties, being the only black kid in the class, and I liked girls, and none of them liked me. Yeah. None of them liked me. They liked all the other guys, but they right. didn't like me. Mm-hmm. So, what was it like for you, starting to grow up and liking girls? It was hard. Um, I think I, in fact, I think I I developed sooner than most boys because I never went through a stage of thinking girls had cooties or anything like that. Same uh, here, bro. I've been liking <laughs> girls from day one. <laughs> from day one. From day number one. And, um, you know, maybe it's our Latino blood. I don't know. But, uh, but uh, you know, I, I, I was definitely um, flirting uh, early on. And early on, I saw it was going to be different for me. Um, girls weren't going to give me the same chance that they were the other guys. Um, you know, it, it really took into junior high and high school for that to be um, kind of communicated and, and, and articulated uh, to where uh, some girls just straight up had the boldness to say, um, you're a nice guy, but you're different and I can't date you. And um, it, w- it was certainly very painful. And it was certainly something that happened more than once. Um, and uh, you know, it wasn't until uh, high school when I got my first girlfriend. And um, you know, she she was very honest in in telling me, you know, look, um, because I asked her, I said, are, are you sure that you you want to go out with me? Like my whole life, girls have told me that they you know can't go out with me. Because I'm just because I'm different. Like that's the only explanation that I ever got was I'm different. And she said, you know, um, I've actually had friends tell me the same thing about you that um, that you know I should maybe not not um, I should consider I should consider what other friends would say. I should consider what other people would say. How they would how they would look upon me. And I'll tell you what, I don't care. I don't care. I like you for you. And I like spending time with you, and um, I think we should get together. And that's how um, my my first girlfriend came about, and we're still great friends to this day. Um, and uh, but that was certainly um, it, it set me up for the the reality, Sean, that even beyond our youth and even beyond um, school days, that um, the rules can certainly still be different in the adult world. Um, maybe people just aren't as, um, as open about it or as, uh, as vocal about it. Um, but I, I certainly have grown up knowing, um, the rules are different and I have two choices. I can either, uh, mope about it and, and be sad about it and be frustrated, or I can keep being me and just trust that, you know, um, the right ones will say yes. And the ones that still have the hangups will say no, and uh, it's going to be their loss. So what year was this in high school that you got your you had your first girlfriend? That was my junior year, so that was 1991. So, bro, guy to guy, it's a long time to be waiting to get with <laughs> to get with a girl. Yeah, because you know when hormones start kicking in. I don't know what happened for for you, but girls started to develop in grade school, and I had crushes on girls in grade school. And it just it just didn't happen. It just didn't happen at all until I got to to high school where I was at a a much bigger school with when there there were all kinds of people at this school. There was black, there was white, there was Asian, there was Latino. So I was able to resume being the guy that you said that you were. We have a lot in common when I was at a school in grade school with a lot of people who were similar to me. I was the most popular kid in my class. And to your point, I remember one day coming into school late. My mom had, we had to commute every day in New Jersey and I would often get to school late. I would often get to school late. Um, Most of the days I showed up late. And I remember walking into class and the first class was a math class. And I had just sat down. Um, Like I hadn't been in my seat for, for, for 20 seconds and the teacher asked, What's nine times nine? You know you're supposed to raise your hand, and, and I and I, I didn't. I just said I just said eighty one, and 
this dude, Darren, biggest kid in the class, was like, damn, he just got here. He just sat down, and he's going to be, like, fully engaged in, in, in class. So I can relate to you going from one extreme that was comfortable to another extreme that was was uncomfortable. And it seems to me like the, the uncomfortable part in terms of just being a normal boy growing up, um, it stayed uncomfortable for a minute. But you make it sound like this whole time you were doing well in school. Having no arms and, and only one leg, how were you able to, to, to get your schoolwork done, do your homework? What, what different things had to be put in place for you to be successful academically? Sure. You know, I don't know exactly when, but I know it was certainly early on. Um, I developed um, really two key phrases that carried me throughout my whole life. And one was um, your attitude will determine your altitude. So I knew I, I knew that that, you know, the more positive I was about my attitude, um, that would get me through the day. And I also knew um, that in life, you need to focus on what you have and not on what you're missing. And um, it certainly it certainly number one, it helped that um, my my uh, my aunt and uncle, my, my second set of parents, they were very driven and they were very strict. Um, so they made it they made it known that uh, excellence in the classroom uh, was not to be hoped for. It was to be expected. And so with those sort of expectations and parameters, I mean, I knew I had to drill down uh, on the books anyway. I also discovered that, again, very early on, even though I couldn't do all the things that I wanted to do as, as just a boy in school, um, I wanted to play sports. I wanted to, I wanted to play football. I wanted to play baseball. Uh, I wanted to do all these things. I saw early on that I couldn't do them, and it certainly was very frustrating. But then I had to look at, okay, well, what can I do? What, what is it possible for me to do? I can go out for the school play. I can uh, write for the school newspaper. And, um, you know, my, my parents were very encouraging in that aspect because right along with you better do good in school because we expect it um, and because you are here in this country to do that. Uh, and, and, and I should add my aunt was an immigrant herself from Colombia. So she very much carried that first generation immigrant mentality of this is why I'm here in this country. This is why you're here in this country. That, that butt better hit the books. And um, there were no two ways about it. And so that firmness was definitely top of the top of the chain for me. Um, but then with that, they said, hey, if if being in the school play, if if being a part of the school newspaper, if uh, going to different leadership camps, things like that, uh, are going to be part of your education experience, then, then we're all for it. And so I quickly learned to shift my mindset to, you know, again, what are the things that I can do? What are the things that I can focus on? And fortunately, I also had developed a, a good friend group that would let me play pickup football. And I was always the, uh, the pass rusher, you know, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, or I had friends that would let me play soccer because they knew I could kick with my with my good leg um i didn't realize it at the time sean but it was really the beginning of of living in gratitude because it was all about be grateful for the things you can do be grateful for the the, the, the things that, that that are available to you um because it's better than having nothing and if you're able to to do those things and and develop good friends with them then uh then that's just what you're gonna have to do and I think anyone who lives with any sort of adversity in their life, no matter what it may be, um, really ends up developing that gratitude mindset of what do I what do I have? What, what, what have I been given? What am I, what am I able to utilize uh, so that I'm not focusing on all the things that I can't do or all the things that I can't have? If you do that, you can drive yourself crazy. Uh, but if you focus on the things that you have and you can do, uh, you can cobble together a, a pretty good life. So, Alex, uh, for all of our viewers, uh, Paulie Paul just joined us, Candy B, um, Luis Sierra, 
uh, Bengal 12321, Gior Georgie, um, Herman Cologne, Alex, you, you, you told our viewers to, to Google your immigration case. Remind us again what to Google Alex Montoya what? Uh, I would just Google Alex Montoya immigration um, suspended deportation because that's what ended up happening was uh, the federal judge um, technically issued an, an order of deportation. And when I say issued, I mean it was, a, it was an issue that, that, that lasted five minutes uh, because he then, he then went through the transaction of suspending it in order for me to stay in this country. And that made headline news. Um, I was on the front page of the San Diego Union Tribune um, in 1992. And I'll actually give you the date. It happened on uh, July 7th of 1992. It was the first time, uh, to my knowledge, that that anyone and any judge um, basically said, I have no, no real legal precedent for this, but I am going to allow someone who technically is illegal, undocumented in this country because his, his medical visa has expired uh, to stay in this country because I believe that he deserves to be here and can contribute to our society. So I guess today it would be called uh, being an activist judge, uh, but that's exactly what he did. He, he went through that legislation specifically to allow me to stay in this country and that is what what really was the, the, the cause and the roots of DACA uh, being created uh, and President Obama uh, created creating the um, American Dreamers Act uh, to allow uh, kids uh, in similar situations like me to be able to stay. So for all of our viewers that are tapped in, please do, do me a favor, like this content, like our video if you're enjoying this live. I see a bunch of people have joined. I don't see anybody liking. Please like so you can help this channel grow. Alex, do you want to take a little a little break before i i ask you to take us through the day of alex uh, through a typical day of alex montoya um somebody who does not have any arms and only has one leg do you want to take a little break or you want to keep going i'm good bro i'm good all right so you don't have arms and you only have one leg you wake up in the morning what does your day look like how does your day start and what is your day like getting through the day? It's, a nor it's normal for you, but none of us can really relate to what it's like being you. So take us through a day of, of Alex Montoya. Sure. So I have two prosthetic arms and a prosthetic leg, uh, both of which I'm able to put on by myself. Um, how? The, how? How? Uh, the, arms, uh, the arms rest uh, on my bed uh, next to me as I sleep. Um, I'm able to slip in and out of them just like a pair of shoes. And then my leg, uh, rests on the floor. Uh, so like, uh, I've always said the joke, you know, most people talk about putting their, uh, pants on one leg at a time. I put my leg on one leg at a time. Uh, you know, it's just sitting there next to my bed and I, I pick up the socket and, um, and, and put on a, a, a sock, uh, that helps, uh, you know, keep the skin protected and slip on. My, my leg. My arms, I should explain, are um, connected uh, by a strap harness um, to me. And so, so I, like I said, I slip, on, I slip into them just like a, a pair of shoes. Uh, it literally takes two seconds. And the strap harness um, keeps my arms together. And then my leg, uh, once I slip into it, stays connected to me through a waist belt. Uh, and, th and that keeps it attached to me. Um, and then um, I am fortunate that the state pays for me to have a helper. And so my helper will come in the morning um, as I've kind of gotten myself started. And uh, she will assist me in getting dressed, in preparing my meals, and in um, keeping my apartment clean. Um, I live alone. I live in a studio. Uh, in downtown San Diego. And so uh, it really is a combination of living independently, but with assistance. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so much of it just goes back to the mindset that my mama taught me, which is you're always going to need help. You're always going to need an assist, but your mindset should be, what can I do by myself? 
And so um, we have it set up so that <clears throat> my helper will come and um, get my day set up, basically get the meals prepared, keep my place clean, get me dressed. But then I'm alone for the day. And, um, you know, I, I just have things set up to where I'm able to uh, operate and facilitate uh, independently um, as a writer, as a speaker. Um, you know, and I certainly make friends with my neighbors and, and with people in my building in, in case I have an emergency. Um, but I, I function fully uh, on my own. And, and again, it's just um, being able to, to, to have the mindset of, okay, the things that I knew I would need help with, um, I, I've gotten assistance with, and now it's on me to kind of take it through the day. And when did this start? When did this, this um, sense of independence, but also needing help every day, when did this start? Did this, did this start in high school? Or, you know, we'll get, we'll get to your college years for, for everyone joining us. Um, Alex was accepted to and graduated from University of Notre Dame. So he's, he's a domer. I know there's, 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 there's domer lovers and there's domer haters out there. Um, when, did, when did this routine for you start? And are there days where you really just don't want to be bothered with your assistant? Because I can imagine some days you just don't want to be bothered. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll, I'll answer the I'll answer the the first part of the question. It really began for me, I would say, in high school. Um, you know, at the time, I didn't realize that um, my, my my mama, and, you know, and and pop were really trying to set me up for the long term um, because there was one day where they basically told me, you know, hey, from now on, um, you're gonna have to get yourself up and and make sure you get to school. And my first reaction was, what, how? And I think I was probably 12 or so at the time. Um, and, you know, they knew that I, that I was in an environment where, especially living in San Diego, I could go to school in a t-shirt and shorts every day. And so they knew that I knew how to do that much. And they knew that I had, because they, they saw me, they knew I could, you know, get together a little breakfast, get together a little toast, get my book bag, and head out, and so they knew that um, that that I could do all of that on my own, and they were really trying to kind of position me, set me up for having that mindset for the rest of my life. Do what you can, and the things that you'll need help with, you'll get assistance. But do what you can, and um, I was very glad they did because it was in high school that I started. Um, looking at colleges and I, I really wanted to uh, see what, what life was like uh, either in the Midwest or on the East Coast. And I knew I wanted to go uh, out of state. And um, uh, the only way that I could even begin to entertain those thoughts within myself was to basically know that, you know, I've done it on my own since junior high, since, since seventh grade. And um, I mean, there was, a, there was a whole lot more that you know, I certainly didn't know and didn't account for, and I'm sure we'll get into that. But just that, just that core belief, that core self belief of you know, I can get myself up and I can get myself going, um, was really what 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 made me entertain thoughts of college and college out of state. And I can tell you that um, I've met a whole lot of people with disabilities and even without disabilities, without physical disabilities that um, the thought of them going away to school, uh, their parents wouldn't have it. Their parents would not have it because it was more the mentality of, well, what are you gonna do without me? Like, like, I'm here to take care of you. And my parents' mentality was more of, we're here to take care of you by helping you to take care of yourself. And, and that, that was, was, was absolutely crucial. Now, as far as the issue of, of um, uh, you know, maybe not wanting to <clears throat> interact, you know, with my helper and such, um, you know, we, we have it set up where, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, she, she certainly doesn't, doesn't uh, overstay her welcome. Uh, <laughs> she knows the mentality that I abide by. So she does all the necessary help and um, takes care of things, set things up. And uh, it's the, it's the perfect balance. I mean, 
we, you know, we're, we, we certainly have a great relationship and we certainly um, will will chat about, you know, our, our day and our life. Um, but uh, there's never a day where where it's like, OK, I'm ready. I'm ready for you to go. Um, she knows that she has me set up for success for the day and uh, we're both good with it. So, Alex, does your helper help you with uh, taking a shower, biological functions, all, all of that? Yes, all of it. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly open about making sure people know that um, anyone who, who is a caregiver um, will do that. And, and, and that that's a need for me. Uh, showering, biological needs, um, you know, you, you name it. Um, any sort of normal day-to-day function that a person with two hands uh, would be able to do, um, she does it all. And she does it all all week long. And, um, you know, I know it's a little bit off topic, but God bless the caregivers because they certainly make it possible for people like me to, to function. So, um, you know, no matter what a person's physical need might be, if, if you know someone that is a caregiver, uh, certainly, you know, give them all the love and respect in the world because they make it possible for someone like me or, or, or someone that is aging, someone that um, just has uh illness but maybe doesn't have a disability per se they make it possible for us to to have a sustained day and um you know because of that um it's uh it it allows me to run my business and uh just have a a good life shout out to all the caregivers for everybody joining us uh chaparrita baby hulk jairo edalberto emma cameron um you're joining us um, live on TikTok, obviously, with Alex Montoya. Alex was born 50 years ago with no arms and one leg, and he is talking us through how his caregiver hooks him up each day and, and, and how he has had to learn how to be um, as independent as possible outside of the things that the caregiver has to, to help him with. Uh, Alex, you apply to college. You get into the University of Notre Dame, you go to Notre Dame, you're leaving your comfort zone, like where you've, you've developed your routine. Uh, before we get to college, you said that your, 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 your aunt, basically your aunt, your uncle were more like, you're going to be independent. Do you think that your mom and your dad would have coddled you more than your aunt and your uncle because you weren't theirs. You weren't their son. Was it easier for them to push you and be like, you're going to be independent and, and not be as coddling and all oh, pobrecito. You, you know what I'm saying? Did, did, have you ever thought of that? Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt my biological parents would have treated me a whole different way just because of their personas. Uh, they were both very much loving and coddling and, and they, and they were like that, you know, with all the kids, I had a, a sister born after I left Columbia. Um, so there were four of us total in our nuclear family and they were very, very loving and coddling with all four. Um, you know, if I had, if I had stayed down there or, you know, circumstances were different, there's no doubt that their mentality would have been far, far different. And I think, you know, again, you know, God works in, crazy ways and his knowledge is always better than ours i think he absolutely planned for me to be placed uh in the home of um uh, you know a second set of parents that were um of a different mentality and were far more of you know again we're going to take care of you by by teaching you how to take care of yourself um I, i i don't know if it was so much that they had different personalities per se um, because I've got four other cousins who I consider siblings, uh, including one cousin who has Down syndrome, uh, Frankie, who, you know, is like a, like a, like a younger brother or like a son to me. And they certainly had to, you know, take care of him in, in, in very, um, close ways. But I think they just simply knew, okay, look, this kid is in this country specifically to succeed. And he has a one in a million chance that millions of other kids in, in, in Latin American countries with disabilities 
don't have. Like, I think, and they've told me this, they felt a responsibility to just push me harder because they knew I had a chance that not many other kids had. Um, and so so that mentality was definitely different on, on their end. Uh, they knew that that was exactly why I was here. And then when everything happened with the immigration judge, they were like, something is something is at play here that's that's way beyond our powers yeah, like this, yeah. this, kid, this kid is meant to be here we better drive him to excellence and uh and so you know they they made no bones about it and they made no bones that uh yeah the the, the mentality for me was was going to be different even than than what they had with their own other kids uh, because my situation was just unique Obviously, man. So, so you get admitted into one of the best schools in the country, one of the most academically competitive schools in the country. What was it like being in the Midwest, away from California, where it gets cold? Now you got to put on more clothes, and you got to you got to deal with ice on the ground, and you've got a prosthetic leg. You got to deal with a whole bunch of things that you never had to deal with before. Talk me through the um, the cultural change and then the the academics of, of, of Notre Dame and, and obviously holding your own academically. Go ahead and start talking. I'm going to get my water bottle real quick, but I can hear you. Go ahead, on. Okay. Sean, my top two universities of choice were Notre Dame and Georgetown University. Your alma mater. Nah, get out of here, bro. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Georgetown turned me down, and uh, and and uh, you know I was I was heartbroken. And now I you said, can't now I can't go get my water. Um, <laughs> our, our loss. Thank you. <laughs> that's our that's, that's that's our loss. Hey, go ahead, go it's, ahead. It's all good, but I, just so you know, I tried to be a Hoya. I, I tried to be a Hoya, uh, and 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 then Notre Dame, um, and um, I loved the academic reputations um, and, 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 you know, strength of both programs and also, uh, you know, the faith uh, component. Um, and um, for me, one of the um, key developments that we haven't talked about yet was the fact that within this time period in uh, 1990, when I was still a, um, a, uh, a junior in high school, the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, the ADA. And that was the most important piece of civil rights legislation for people with disabilities in America, and, and really by extension the world, um, in our history. And so from what I quickly learned about this law was that um, it basically granted access and I guess you could say support where there was not before. And so I knew that um, buildings that were inaccessible for people, people with disabilities now had to become accessible. And I knew that colleges that um, really had not regarded the needs of people with disabilities had to do so. And so it was perfect timing for me because I knew by the time it became federal law in 1992, I was gonna be heading off to school. So I went off to school with the knowledge that um, I now had a law that was going to really, in theory, make it easier for me to be able to do that and achieve those goals. What I didn't realize was that there's certainly a difference between private institutions and public ones. And there's a different mentality between um, schools outside of California where progress is a whole lot slower. And when I arrived to Notre Dame, um, I, I remember the first question that I asked them was, uh, so can I check out your disabled services department? And their response was, well, we have a committee. And I said, a committee? And they said, yeah, we have a committee that basically looks at the need of every disabled student accepted and we assess, we, we, we assess their needs and figure out um, how to help them. And, and you know, all of a sudden- the That could take became, forever. <laughs> yeah, and the student became the teacher because I said, you know there's a law that was just passed, federal law that mandates you have to have 
you know, X, Y, and Z services. And, and I think they just kind of leaned on their history, their tradition of basically kind of unofficially saying, you know, we'll get to it when we get to it. Yeah. And it really became, it really got to a head when um, it came to a head when in my freshman semester, like you said, I had already um, seen that the Midwest, South Bend, Indiana, just 90 miles south of Chicago was a whole lot colder, a whole lot wetter, um, you know, change of seasons, all of that than sunny Southern California. And I saw that I was going to have to put on a whole lot more layers, a whole lot more coats, things like that. But it really came to a head when I was assigned to a English class taught by the university uh, president. And that class uh, would meet once a week and you had to walk three flights of stairs to get to his class. And it was in the main administration building, the one with the famous golden dome on the very top. And my very first day I, I showed up and I said, okay, if class is on the third floor, where's the elevator? And they said, what elevator? And at that point, I mean, just instantly, I knew that this was um, a very physical um, um, roadblock or example of where change was going to was going to you know need need to be met. Alex, and so, why didn't you sue the school? <laughs> why didn't you sue you the know, school? At at that point, probably just because I was a a naive freshman who who uh, wanted to work within the system. Um, and, you know, believe me, I had other people say that, but, but I'll tell you exactly what I did, Sean. And, and it's something I actually encourage today. Um, uh, I went to the university president and said, Hey man, if you want me to get to your class, uh, I got to walk three flights of stairs on one leg, like you got no elevator. And his response was actually, um, very caring. I'm sure he had a lawsuit in the back of his mind as well. Um, I, I, I wrote a, I wrote a letter to the editor back when people would do that to the school paper. And I, I laid out the whole case and, um, you know, he, he basically said to me, uh, okay, look, uh, we're going to do things kind of in three steps. Um, we're going to, uh, meet on the first floor. If we need to, we're going to have people help you, uh, with your book bag to get up to the, um, to the third floor. Uh, but those are, those are temporary solutions. Uh, kind of the mid range solution is, we're going to convene a committee, which, which, if you know anything about bureaucracy, is kind of the standard answer. We're going to convene a committee to figure out what we need to do as a campus, and then um, long term, we're going to figure out what we need to do as a campus. And the whole reason I didn't sue or didn't take any drastic actions was because by the end of my four years there, I thought it would take ten. I thought it would take twenty. By the end of my four years there. Uh, they actually tore apart the main administration building, installed an elevator, made all kinds of physical changes on campus, and then um, not only um, made a uh, disabled services department, but created a disabled services center um, that the whole campus could could benefit from. And uh, you know, it certainly helps that uh, our favorite Catholic institutions um, they ain't poor. So they had a lot of resources to be able to, to, to make those changes. But again, knowing that I had the law on my side and knowing that it was a new law, um, I knew that it was the perfect time to really make this advocacy um, and that, that the university had no choices. If they had, their, if they had the resources, which they did, um, they were going to have to make all of these changes. Um, if they hadn't come through, would I have, would I have done other um, – you know, gone to, to other solutions, probably. I think I would have, but fortunately, um, I wasn't confronted, you know, with, with that choice. I mean, everything was done uh, by the time I was ready to graduate. Hey, uh, you're joined by, uh, I'm, we're, we're joined by uh, Alex Montoya. Uh, I want to welcome Nick Lanza, who just, who just tapped in, Mary Kex83, Bryson R2021 just joined. Um, you're listening to a conversation between me, Sean Shepard, and Alex Montoya. Alex is taking us through uh, his period of time at the University of Notre Dame, where uh, 
his presence at the school caused them to become what I'd like to call ADA compliant, the American Disabilities Act compliant, because Alex was born with, with no arms and, and just one leg. And he just got done explaining to us a, a class that he had to attend on campus on the third floor. And the university president actually taught this campus. And Alex, with no arms and one leg, anytime he had to go to that class, he had to figure out how he was going to get up three flights of stairs when the law had passed in the United States where you can no longer discriminate against people with disabilities, your physical facility had to accommodate people with disabilities, meaning that something as simple as the doorway had to be wide enough for someone in a wheelchair to get through. Um, the bathrooms that we use, uh, there needs to be a, dis a disabled stall there. And just little things that you and I, people who have all of our limbs, uh, among other things, when it comes to disabilities, that we, we take for granted. And Alex, I asked you about suing the school because, God rest his soul, uh, my, my best friend Roy, his father is an attorney in San Diego, and he went after ADA, ADA uh, he went after businesses that were not ADA compliant. And it was my understanding that if you went into, let's just say a McDonald's and you went into the bathroom and you couldn't get your wheelchair in the bathroom, Mr. Landers, the attorney would say, buy something from McDonald's that day, a drink, whatever's 99 cent, keep the receipts. Every time you go into that establishment, it's a fine. I don't remember what it was, but let's just say it's $5,000. And take pictures of this non-ADA compliant place. There are so many places in our country, in California, that still aren't compliant with ADA rules. There are still places that you go to today where there's no elevator to get to the higher floors or the doorways are too narrow in 2024 and i guess you have owners that are just rolling the dice hoping that they don't get caught because they get sued for a lot of money now yeah. you yeah, should be able, you should be able to go anywhere that anybody else is able to go that's exactly what it is sean and you know um my overall mentality of work within the system do what you can uh to 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 help them and educate them I mean, number one, it, it certainly wasn't lost on me that it was a, a university, a university that I basically, you know, wanted to to, to go to, uh, a, pl a place that I knew I was going to have to be, you know, for four years. So I also didn't want to make enemies, per se. Um, but it absolutely was key that the ADA had just been passed. And I knew there was going to be uh, just a time of transition. Now that the ADA has been in effect for over 30 years, it's inexcusable for any place to not be compliant. And you're right, uh, business owners roll the dice just hoping that no one is going to pursue litigation because they certainly can't say they didn't know, they certainly can't say they weren't told, and they, they certainly can't say, well, um, you know, no one has come here uh, that, 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 would, that would need those sort of accommodations, uh, we're past all that. I mean, you know, again, it was it was um, it was passed in '90, and it became law in '92, and so we've had over 30 years for uh, this law to take effect. And fortunately, now because of the law, when something um, is is built from scratch, any sort of new building has all of those specifications, uh, you know, within them, but existing buildings. Um, still, still skirt the law, and they uh, they try to get away with as much as they can. And like most things in life, when you try to take a shortcut, you end up going the longer route. And I always, you know, just tell them, spend the money, do what you got to do to become accessible, and it will save you whatever whatever you got to pay will save you ten times more than you will end up having to pay if somebody sues you. No doubt. I'm, I'm pulling up a picture of you. I want, I want people to be able to see. Oh my. Check it out. 
This is this is yeah. Alex. Uh, Alex, where was this picture taken? This looks like uh, the pier in OB. Uh, IB. Okay, so you're you're in Imperial Imperial Beach. This is what Alex looks like. Uh, you're joining us uh, with my my guest and my 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 dear friend Alex Montoya, uh, born with no arms and, and and one leg, and he's talking us through his time at University of Notre Dame. So Alex. Our viewers don't know that you are an author, you're a motivational speaker. I want to talk about your books. What made you decide that you wanted to write your first book and what was your first book about and how many books have you written? Okay. Thank you so much for that. Um, so ever since I was 10 years old, uh, I pretty much knew two things. I knew that my first love in life was writing and that I that I loved being a writer. In fact, my fourth grade teacher um, told my aunt, uh, whatever you do, however you develop this kid in life, he needs to be a writer because that is his main skill set. And, um, you know, side note, it just goes to show you something that even a great a grade school teacher, you know, tells you at 10 years old can stick with you for the rest of your life, because as soon as she said that that seed was planted. And um, and so I knew that uh, that I loved writing and I just knew even at at 10, even just being in this country for a mere six years or so, I knew that my story was different enough that uh, it merited writing a book and being able to educate others uh, on these experiences. Um, and so um, what I did was I always I uh, had in the back of my mind. Uh, growing up and starting out as a young professional of what I wanted um, that book to look like. And it wasn't until 2006 when I was hired uh, into the San Diego Padres corporate office where I was blessed to meet you uh, that to me, it kind of felt like a great pinnacle of sorts in the sense of I had experienced so many challenges and hardship um, to, to get to that point in life. And to get to that point in my career that I knew that was kind of a, a good place to just share my story. And so um, what I would do is um, in the in the baseball offseason, uh, which, you know, uh, is basically November through March, um, I would go home every night from work and I would work on this book. And um, before the age of, of Amazon self-publishing and before the age of of you know doing a lot of, a lot of things digitally um it, there were there, there was a whole lot of copies being made and a whole lot of uh, trees being killed because of of you know uh, prints that i would make at home until we found a, until we found a publisher um uh, and, and and with the padre's blessing um uh, i basically shared the story of my life and i shared the story of of getting hired by them um and i entitled the book swinging for the fences because I knew that it had um, just a good baseball motif, but it also matched my mentality of what I really wanted to communicate to people, which was not, look at me, I'm great, look at all the stuff I've overcome. It was so much of what I've overcome is because of the mentality that yeah. I had and the mindset. And none of this is by accident. And I just wanted to encourage everyone, you know, look, if I can overcome being born as a triple amputee and I can overcome all these different challenges and I can overcome the immigration challenges as well. And I can overcome all these different roadblocks and obstacles. Why can't you, why can't you? I wanted people to start thinking big and start thinking about how much of a gift their life was. Um, and, and, and I'll add one thing, Sean, it, it, it always has kind of occurred to me as I've looked around different people, and I hear them complaining or I hear them just talking about, you know, um, they can't do this, they can't do that for whatever reason. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking to myself, you realize you're talking to a dude with one limb about limitations, whether they're limitations that, you know, the, 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 the you have or that life and society puts on you. And I'm not saying that they're not right or I'm not saying that people don't have limitations put on them. All of us do. All of us do, but we all have a responsibility to figure out 
What do I got to do to get past it? What do I got to do to either work within the system or change the system to make things better and to make my life improve? And so I wrote that um, Swinging for the Fences with that mindset of I really want to encourage people. And that's the main role that I believe God put me on this earth for. I call it my ministry is to be able to show the world that we can do all things through Christ, that he can take Whatever scripture says, he will take whatever uh, your weakness is and make it your strength. If you have faith, if you have the right mindset, if you have the right attitude, if you just go about it the right way. And so um, here we are now. That book was published in 2008. And so within those 16 years, um, I am blessed to tell you that I have uh, authored or co-authored uh, 11 books. 11 now. 11, uh, including two children's books. And uh, somewhere along the way, I basically uh, said, you know, I, I, I have had the satisfaction of uh, writing all these books and, and, and producing them. I want to be able to help others tell their story and uh, either co-author or, or ghostwrite um, their story, because I believe we all have a story. You certainly have a story and story that the world needs to hear. And um, I, my, my, my passion now is just simply in being able to help others tell their story uh, and just, you know, pass the baton, pass the torch, help people to, uh, to, to, to overcome, you know, the next generation, overcome their challenges. So, Alex, off the top of your head, can you tell us all, the names of all 11 books? I believe so. OK, so hang on, hang on, hang on. Before you do that. Where can we buy your books? Okay, so simply uh, go on Amazon. Uh, I have an I have an Amazon author page. Uh, so if you type in Alex Montoya books, uh, you will see all my books listed. Um, I will give one caveat. Um, ironically, there is a preacher out there with my same name who has released a couple of. Um, of uh, very spiritual religious books that actually are not mine. Um, but I, I kind of chuckle at the fact that, that if someone's going to have my name, um, that they they are at least faith based books. Um, but, uh, but just kind of take a look at the covers and take a look at the description of each book. Uh, and you'll see which one is, is the real Alex Montoya and which one is, is the other, uh, uh, priest i believe it is so amazon alex montoya books and i do have an amazon author page all right so um, tell me the names of all your books okay wow i haven't done this in a while but um uh first one was swinging for the fences uh 2008 second one was the finish line and i wrote that about my experience uh, doing the rock and roll marathon uh, as a triple amputee uh the one after that was see the good uh, where it's all about uh, seeing the good that adversity can bring. Uh, the one after that, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're counting for me. The one after that was, um, was uh, living inspired, of having the mentality of living inspired within life. Uh, that's four. Now, this is where it gets a little murky because I think this is where I started helping out other people. Okay. Uh, there was one called uh, uh, Don't Tell Judy No, and that was one that I co-authored with the first female public school superintendent in the state of Texas. Um, there is one called um, um, uh, Mary Jean Anderson. Uh, I'm actually forgetting the title. Uh, Mary Jean Anderson, who was uh, one of the first female uh, philanthropists in California uh, running a, a, a plumbing business. Um, and so it's the, the story of Mary Jean Anderson. I think that's that was that's six. So then we've got back back to my books. We kind of went back to my projects. Uh, <clears throat> you got this, um, uh, along with um, uh, Alex Masters of the Monkey Bars. Mm. Um, uh, Is that eight? That was, that was my first children's book. That was eight. Uh, then you've got a book by um, my man Beto Gurmilan, who uh, became paralyzed in a surfing accident. And uh, has also lived a very inspirational life. Uh, that was from my chair. Uh, is the title of his book. 
and then the the other two that uh, that are uh, that are my creations. Uh, one adult book, one children's book. Uh, the adult book was called uh, "I'm Not a Robot," uh, mm. which, I, which I published uh, last year. And then my second children's book published this year. And I told you the story earlier um, uh, uh, about the candy. Uh, you know, Alex hides the candy, and uh, and so that was my second children's book. Uh, where again, I, I take the story of of hiding candy in my arms to illustrate uh the need for uh kids to show kindness to others just want to show everybody this is what alex looks like um and he's taking us through all 11 books that he has written he's a, a very accomplished author um born with no arms and one leg alex i think you're forgetting a book i think you're forgetting a book about the wolf pack the wolf pack oh my gosh they're gonna kill me if they see this. So the Wolf Pack was um, my only nonfiction. I'm sorry, fiction uh, book that I have written to this point, where I just took a stab at creating a story, creating a narrative. Um, I I based it on um, a group of friends that, that that you and I know that you and I are part of um, in San Diego um, just before 2020. And we were all kind of at different crossroads in our lives. Uh, but of course, names and identities were changed to protect the innocent. Um, but I, but I and protect the guilty too. And protect, and protect the guilty. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, it was really just kind of a, a coming of age story of, uh, of, of a diverse group of friends uh, in San Diego, which is, um, which is really not a, a very diverse uh, area in itself. And just, you know, uh, how to make it and how, how to make it through life and how to make it, uh, you know, when, when challenges come your way. Um, so that was kind of my first stab at, um, I guess you could say fiction, nonfiction, but, uh, creating a story from, from life events other than my own. So Alex, um, we've been going for a little over 90 minutes. I want to, I want to talk about your motivational speaking and what what inspired you to get into that outside of the obvious i mean you really in in motivational speaking it's you want to give back you know and i'm saying this because i know you some people motivationally speak because strictly for the money but take us through that motivational speaking journey and and, and where it took you um around the country and and beyond what what's your main message when you do your motivational speaking sure you know it all really kind of happened um by accident um as i said i have always first and foremost been a writer and um writing was always my my comfort zone really did not like public speaking most people don't and when I published my first book, um, I was surprised by the number of places and institutions that asked for a presentation. And I quickly saw, and this is kind of a, a note for anyone out there that is thinking about writing something. Um, writing a book gives you credibility. When you publish a book, all of a sudden, and I don't agree with this, but it's just the way the world is, your story has more credibility. People people want to hear your story more. Why? Because it's in a book. That's what I discovered. And yeah. so um, I quickly saw that I was going to have to go out of my comfort zone and be um, comfortable presenting my story in order for people to read the book and read the story. Um, I left the Padres after 10 years in their office uh, because I was ready for a new adventure and I was ready to really tell my story more fully and i was i was prepared to write more about it and speak more about it and and just convey um the message uh, the me the main message being that um we all have challenges and we all have adversity and we can all overcome it that's really the main bread and butter and it may sound a little simple to some uh, but i believe that it's uh, it's something that a lot of people um, don't really get or they say, well, 
this person overcame their challenges, but I can't. Um, or, you know, my situation is too dire for me to overcome, you know, my challenges. I want to just really provide that encouragement to everyone that no matter what the challenges might be, that they are capable of overcoming and giving back and being able to serve in such a way that they help others overcome their challenges. Um, I have been blessed to be doing this now uh, as a business and also to um, benefit a, a foundation that I began in 2020, the Alex Montoya Foundation. Um, and I've been very blessed to travel the country. I returned to Colombia and, and, and told my story there. Uh, I've traveled to Southern Mexico, uh, been just about every state uh, in the U.S., not, not, not quite all 50, but a good chunk. And um, it, it's really, Sean, I tell you what, it's really been amazing to me how as divided as we are and as, as differently as we might view the world uh, and view our country in different cities, different states, different regions, I've been all over. And the one thing that I've seen in every single place that I have been in is we all have challenges of some sort. Mm-hmm. And we all need to be reminded uh, that that it, it's okay to ask for assistance. I mean, I've had great assistance throughout my life, and I, I get assistance every day. But it's also incumbent upon us to focus on what you have and not on what you're missing and live a great life. And I guess you could say that's my main message. I'm just trying to bring people hope to show them that, that yeah, whatever it is they're going through, they can overcome it and great things can, can happen from it. That's, that's a, it's a great message to, to have for folks. I want to welcome everybody who's still tapping in. Isaiah Spencer just joined us. Carolyn just joined us. Michael, Katie Groff joined us. I don't know if she's still in. If you all have some questions for Alex, Please go ahead on and uh, ask them in the chat. Uh, we're not going to be on um, live much longer. Alex, uh, I'd have to imagine that there have been some dark moments in, in, your, in your life um, with just the challenges that you face on a, on a daily basis, day after day, week after week, month, year after year. Um, what has gotten you through those moments? Who has gotten you through those moments? Who and what do you lean on the most? And I'm glad you asked that. One aspect of this journey that I did not expect um, that, that, that it really kind of opened my eyes to was the impact and importance of mental health. Um, I think for two main reasons. I think number one, I just never realized, um, you know, the, the 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 ramifications of mental health and, and kind of the importance of it. But then also as a country, uh, you know, when you and I growing up were growing up in the seventies and eighties and nineties, it was just never talked about. It was it was a very taboo subject. Never. And so I never even it never dawned upon me to to think about mental health as a uh, as a as a as a a subject. Um, and as I went through this journey of, of overcoming my disability, overcoming the immigration challenges, um, just being an immigrant in this country, uh, being a person with disability in this country, um, it really truly wasn't until probably the last three, four years that I saw the vast impact that that had on my mental health. And once I realized that and once I recognized it, I, I, I became committed to having that be a main uh, beneficiary of, of my work, of my outreach. Um, I, um, I'm, I'm a proud member of the Rotary Club for Mental Health and Wellness, uh, mm-hmm. which is a virtual club that people can find online as well. Um, and so I, 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 I really kind of um, – I like to say that I stumbled upon it. But obviously, God led me to it uh, as, as something that uh, I needed to see, but I needed to also help others with as well. But without question, the um, number one thing that really has carried me through these challenges has been my faith. And um, again, in the same way that I realized early on 
that I was meant to be a writer and meant to be a communicator, I saw that God had certainly touched my life. It was just something that I knew without kind of knowing what to do with it. And it wasn't until um, my, my teenage years when all of these challenges, you know, really started to, to kind of become more realized and I kind of realized uh, just all, all the things I realized girls aren't going to treat me the same way that they do other guys. And there are buildings out there that don't have elevators and ramps. And there are, um, you know, barriers to my success in this world. Um, what the heck am I going to do? And um, it was at that point that I realized that I needed to have a stronger relationship with Christ and really give myself to him in order to have faith and love be the cornerstone of overcoming all of it. And as anyone who lives in faith, you know, will tell you it's a journey and it's a process and there's a whole lot of growing and a whole lot of mistakes you got to do um, to, to really get to a point where you can really see that, that, that you're being molded in the right way. Uh, but it really has changed my entire outlook on life. Um, I have seen where different people have influenced me in, in different ways. You know, I had my biological parents who uh, gave me really unconditional love. And uh, my biological mother um, passed away October 10th of last year. And so I really spent the last year uh, really um, reflecting on, on, you know, the sacrifice that, that my parents made in letting me move to the U.S. so that I could grow up and have uh, opportunities that I wouldn't have had down there. My aunt and uncle that became a second set of parents to me here, um, they had a little more of a brand of tough love. But that was certainly what I needed at that moment, at that stage, to set me up for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my cousins who became siblings, my biological siblings, my cousin Frankie, who, because he has Down syndrome, uh, shows you the meaning of unconditional love every single time he sees you. He can be a real pain in the neck, but he will give you unconditional love every single time. Um, I, I look at people like you, man, who constantly inspire me and motivate me and show me that, you know, one person, one person can make such a difference in this world uh, that, you know, that just fuels me every single day. So, you know, I know that's just kind of a handful of people, but um, I see where God places certain people in my life at different points uh, to not only help me to overcome my challenges, but to help me further uh, my 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 mission and my ministry and life of helping others overcome. As you know, I'm very involved in uh, my church here in San Diego, local church San Diego in downtown San Diego. Uh, proud to say I, I've, I've helped them uh, to, um, to be founded and then grow over the last three years. And uh, it's just an extension of everything we've talked about. Uh, everyone needs to just figure out what is it that I got to overcome? How can I overcome it? And um, how can I... How can I then help others overcome? Because, um, you know, pe people ask me, you know, do you go through dark moments? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have absolutely recognized where I have had depression, anxiety. I've been discouraged. I've had all these things. Um, but then um, in, this, in the same breath, people will usually ask, uh, well, you know, what fuels you, what motivates you? And I believe, Sean, it is this. The day that I'm called home, the day that, you know, the Lord takes me to heaven, he already knows that I, I, I walked around on this earth with, with a prosthetic leg and prosthetic arms. Like he already knows all the challenges that I had. He was the one that made me that way, right? What he's going to want to know is what did you do with the opportunities I gave you? And that includes the challenges. That includes the adversities. What did you do with everything the sunny days and the storms what did you do with those things what did you do in order to make this world a better place and uh, i hold that very closely to my heart i take that very seriously uh i know i'm going to be accountable to god uh in terms of uh okay lord this was this was a situation that that, that you put me in this, these were the cards that i was dealt and this is what i did and um that that really is what what fuels me on a day-by-day -day basis Personal question, 
Have you been suicidal? Um, I have not been suicidal, um, and I've never wanted to inflict any sort of self-harm. But I will say, in my darkest of moments, I certainly have um, said those things that, that, that people uh, who often uh, have self-harm uh, kind of use as, as a starting point, which is to say this world would be, would be better off without me. I, I certainly have had those thoughts of this world would, would be better off without me. Um, the people that I know, their lives would be better without me uh, because they wouldn't have to take care of me. And I also wouldn't have to just endure all the challenges that I've had to endure. Um, but I'm very glad to say that um, once I once I began having those thoughts, and a lot of it was within the depression that I that I uh, was was experiencing when when my mama, my my second mom, when she passed away six years ago, I was really having more of those thoughts. And once I recognized those, uh, that was really a starting point for me. Uh, focusing on my mental health, and so I would say for anyone that 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 is having those thoughts or or more than those thoughts, that 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 has to be the the beginning of the discussion of I got to get my mental health looked at. And listen, I asked you that question because I've experienced those thoughts and haven't had to deal with the things that you've had to deal with. I've had to deal with my own stuff, and to your point. The thing that got me past those thoughts and feeling like maybe I didn't want to be here anymore was was God. I prayed. I remember the prayer that I prayed. I said, God, either either take me, either change my life or take my life. And um, obviously. God wanted me to stay here and get some things done on on his behalf and in, in, in his name. So I wanted to I wanted to ask you that question. I want to thank you for your honesty being open and transparent. I want to say to anybody who's tapped in right now, uh, if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling like you want to harm yourself, if you're feeling like you don't want to be here anymore, there are people that love you. Reach out, ask for help. I know that asking for help is one of the most difficult things that we as human beings can, can do, but ask for help. Somebody wants to help you. People love you. People want you here. Even though it feels like they don't, even though it feels like you may not want to, um, people are here for you. So I want to thank you for, for sharing that, Alex. And thank you for sharing your incredible story. For those of you that are still tapped in, please follow Alex Montoya on TikTok. Um, follow us here at, at, at the original Game Changer. Again, I'm, I'm Sean Shepard, Alex Montoya. Um, thanks for spending this incredible, just about, let me see how long we've been at this, just about two hours, bro, um, talking about your incredible journey of being born with no arms and one leg and, and all that you've accomplished as an author, as a motivational speaker, as a, as a son, as um, a great friend, as uh, mi primo. I, I, I really appreciate your friendship, love you like a brother, and um, this has been great learning about you and in, in your journey. And I'm hoping that other people were inspired listening to you. Alex, you want to plug anything? You have, you got a website you want people to visit again. Alex is an accomplished author. He's written, um, I say 12 books, go to Amazon, look up Alex Montoya books on Amazon, Alex Montoya books. Um, not the pastor, not the pastor, Alex Montoya. Um, this guy, Alex Montoya, look yeah. up that guy, Alex Montoya books on Amazon. Um, he's written some great stuff, some great stuff. Um, you want to plug anything, Alex, before we bounce? Sure. Sean, I love you. I appreciate the, the invitation. I absolutely don't believe that it was uh, a coincidence that you invited me on the anniversary of my mom's passing. I mean, that that wow. that that is cosmic and divine in and of itself. Um, I would love to hear from people. Um, I'll give a couple quick plugs. Um, they can either find me uh, on social media or um, as you said, uh, check out my uh, Alex Montoya books page on Amazon or go to alexmontoya.org. Um, that, um, that will tell them a little more about my foundation. Uh, my dream is to have this story uh, communicated in a broader 
uh, way. So if anyone happens to have any connections to the uh, film industry, TV industry, you know, uh, any anyone in entertainment, uh, please let me know. Uh, and and that is something that, that I'm putting out there. I'm just believing that someday, you know, we're going to take this beyond books and be able for people to be able to see it uh, on a screen. Um, but above all, I just want to encourage everyone to keep their head up, to know that uh, we all have challenges. But if you focus on what you have and not on what you're missing and you let God lead the way, your life will be incredible and you will impact the lives of generations. I love you, bro, and I'm just so thankful. Hey, I appreciate that. And for everybody that's still tapped in, tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Pacific time, I will be hosting my Cops and Convicts podcast. Uh, we'll be going live on Facebook, um, hopefully Instagram. Instagram's been a pain in the butt. Uh, LinkedIn, YouTube. Check out the original Game Changer, the original Game Changer on, on YouTube. Uh, I'll be interviewing um, current lieutenant inside of the L.A. County Sheriff's Department. Her name is CeCe Strong. She has written a book called Betrayal and the Badge. She currently has a lawsuit against the L.A. County Sheriff's Department. Um, like you, Alex, she's an author, and I'm really interested in hearing her story. So if you have time, check us out tomorrow, 6 p.m. Pacific time on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, Alex, salute. Cuídate, mi primo. Um, I'll get with you after we, we get offline, but thanks, everybody, for tapping in. Alex Montoya. Alex Montoya. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for tapping in. Love, Love you, you all. Thank you. Love you, bro. Love you, bro. All right.